Welcome to the Agents of Fandom podcast. We are very slappy, I mean very happy to have you with us today. I am your host, TJ Zwarich. I'm joined as always by my co-host, Garrett. How's it going, Garrett? It's going good, guys. I'm happy to be back. Another, I feel like I say this every time, but I, for real, I feel like we haven't recorded in like a, a long time. So I'm, I'm, I've been like itching to get back on camera and, and, and finally talk about Moon Knight. Exactly. We've had these screeners for, you a few, for a few days, and so we are excited to finally get to talk about them. And we are joined by a special guest today, our friend from Streamer, Mo. How's it going, man? It's going really well, thanks. I'm just really excited to be on here and just chat with you guys, because like you guys, I've had the screeners for a while. and I'm, I think I had it for a bit longer than you did, and I was just like, I could only say what Disney let me say. I had to get everything approved through them. And so now all I want to do is just squeal about the first episode because I can't even talk about the other three. <laughs> exactly. So before we get started, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about uh, about what you do in your platform? Yeah, so Streamer, I started it about a year, just over a year ago now. Um, and what we were doing, what we focused on is instead of just covering a specific uh, types of content we wanted to look at covering all different types of streaming services and the, the kind of key things that you should watch on there because there's so many and there's not many of them are available uh, in different parts of the world at the same time and not many shows and stuff like that are there um, so we want to make sure that we're only covering things that will be on a streaming service um, everywhere around the world um, and we're only covering news that applies to the vast majority of people as opposed to specifically for America or specifically for one type of streaming service because um, people will have access to different ones. So that's what we're doing there. Um, I think we did, we actually did try and do a bit of a podcast, but it's just got too messy and I was like, oh no, I can't be about this because <laughs> I wound up swearing a lot <laughs> and it was just not not very conducive to creating a good <laughs> a good impression i'll just keep my swearing to twitter <laughs> yeah we go. we we had to we had to not swear for you know the good first couple of months of our podcast while we were building up our audience and mm. behind the scenes tj and i were, were were a couple of sailors so i think we did a really <laughs> good job of keeping our mouths shut for the for for until we became independent and now you know we talk a little bit more freely we try not to try not to go too crazy but uh I know how it feels to to to, to try not to hold that back that 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 waterfall yeah. of words. Yeah, we're not yeah. restricted with the age rating anymore, but I do still have a few of my uh, a few of my students are loyal subscribers to the podcast, so I like to I like to still keep a little bit of a filter on while mm. we're while we're on the air. So make sure you uh, <laughs> make sure you follow uh, Mo and Streamer on Twitter, all the socials. You can also find Agents of Fandom on Twitter at Agents Fandom as well as any of the other socials, Agents of Fandom. Take a peek at our TikTok because we have a few new content creators, our friend Layla, Falcons Nat, as well as Ethan, 15 Minutes of Marvel, and Ariana, our, our brand new TikTok creators, and they posted some stuff lately. So make sure you give that a check. And look at our website, agentsoffandom.com. The last two days have been our highest traffic days on the website. You can find my spoiler-free review of Moon Knight. You can find uh, uh, Optical Cinema, Elijah Boxdale, his spoiler-free review of Moon Knight. So make sure you check that out as well. We also have our recent interviews with Alex Garfin, J uh, J Jordan Kent from Superman and Lois, as well as our super fun Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. special episode with Jomi Adeneron from the Ringerverse. We had a blast with that one, so make sure you check those out. In the future, we got big stuff coming as well, so make sure you subscribe to the podcast, like the video, comment so we can keep bringing you this awesome stuff. Give us a five-star rating on Apple and Spotify. Leave us a nice little review because we can confirm that we have Ms. Marvel interviews coming. As soon as those junkets start up, we're going to be having interviews for that, and we want to keep bringing you this awesome content, so make sure you like the video, subscribe, give us those five-star ratings so you can keep giving you this stuff the other thing we're going to be doing is like we said we've already seen the first four episodes of moon Knight, so our theorizing it's going to be it's going to be lower you're going to get lower frequencies of theorizing than we've had in the past for these shows because we know more than we usually do and so we're strictly going to be theorizing about things we do not know about and so if there's something you want us to talk about 
we will make sure we'll be spoiler free. But if there's something specific you want us to talk about, hit us up on Twitter, hit us up on any of the socials. But if you want to make sure your question gets asked, head over to Apple Podcasts, leave a review, write your question in there, and we will make sure we cover it on the podcast. Now, before we talk Moon Knight, we got to get into a little bit of Marvel and DC news. We're going to talk about the Oscars and we're not going to talk about the slap heard around the world, but we are going to get into the ridiculous and ludicrous fan voting stuff that they decided Mm. to put into the Oscars this year. And it would be one thing if I understand they're trying to bring in new viewers to the Oscars because viewership is dropping, but oh, this stuff just didn't really go well. They decided to do Twitter polls and it was taken over by uh, the Snyder cult as well as uh, Cinderella fans and Camilla Cabello fans around the world. I don't think it was the fans. (laughs) Yeah, it's fair. I don't think it was the fans. Trolls around the world. And (laughs) the problem with it isn't just that the awards exist. I love the idea of bringing in more viewers. That's great. But you have people like Samuel L. Jackson with Lifetime Achievement Awards who... That would be something I want to watch. There aren't all aspects of the Oscars I'm interested in, but I would have loved to see Samuel L. Jackson give an awesome speech. But instead, we got to see Army of uh, the Dead win uh, Best Movie of the Year, which I liked Army of the Dead. It wasn't the best movie of the year uh, from a fan voting Twitter perspective. And we see Ezra Miller's Flash entering the Speed Force as the number one fan excitement moment. This wasn't even a movie that was in theaters. This was a movie that was on HBO Max from home. Like no one was freaking out about, it was cool. Don't get me wrong. It was a cool moment, but it wasn't near on the level of Avengers Endgame, Avengers Assemble, nor the Spider-Man, the Spider-Man gathering in uh, Spider-Man No Way Home. So we're going to, I don't want to touch too long about that, but it brings us right into our next point, which is, Ezra Miller, who has once again run into some trouble with the law. Uh, They were arrested after an altercation, drunkenly, disorderly conduct, harassing people, swearing at them, assaulting them in the bar. The Flash had its very first test screening yesterday. So it's a bit too late to give us the new Flash, but what do you think about this whole situation, Mo? Uh... I think Ezra Miller has some issues that they need to work out um, because we all saw the choking video, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't really know what's what's going on, and obviously they've got uh, Crimes of Grindelwald coming up in what two weeks, a week. Um, yeah, really soon. So yeah, they're going to be in the public eye a lot with this, but I don't know. It's it's, it's, it's all very... I don't know what's going on with Hollywood this week. <laughs> it all feels like maybe maybe the deals with the devils expired and now they're, they're really, really awful people. But oh. <laughs> And, like, what's the th- tough thing, too, is, like, we're very sensitive on this podcast to, to mental health and to addiction. And these are two things that Ezra's clearly struggling with, but that doesn't mean that your actions don't have consequences. And when you seem to be at this point going out of your way to cause problems in the public eye for a lot of other people and causing harm to a lot of other people, there got to be consequences for this, these actions. And so, like you said, it's, we have, Crimes of Grindelwald coming out. We have the Flash coming out. It might be a bit too late to to can these things, but I've always wanted to see a Andrew Garfield the Flash because I think that would just be <laughs> phenomenal. I think he'd be perfect. But what's Garrett? What are your thoughts on this situation? I have a couple of thoughts. Um, Hawaii. This happened in Hawaii, right? Yeah. I don't know if either of you guys have been to Hawaii, but it's like so peaceful. It's like serenity. It's beautiful. It's it's fun. It's 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 not this. Um, so that was my first. I was like, wow, I've been to Hawaii and never once did I, you know, get drunk at a bar and think about attacking people. But to your point, TJ, you know, dealing with the, with mental issues is is such a struggle in and of itself. But having to do it 
in the public eye. Like I can't even imagine what that's like. Um, we've seen it time and time again. I don't, I don't want to specifically name anybody. Everyone knows, everyone knows who they associate with this thing when I, when, when I say it. So think about that person and, and, and try to give some sympathy, but we, they need to find help. Uh, they need to find some help and, and there should probably be re repercussions in the future. Like you said, TJ, these movies are coming out soon. They're, the crimes of Grindelwald or Alder, um, Fantastic Beasts is coming out, like you said, Mo, in, in two weeks. And Flash just had a test screening. So these are like in, far in development. But in the future, I mean, we've seen, we've seen WB do some crazy stuff with Johnny Depp and the Amber Heard situation. And so honestly, who knows if they're even going to dole out punishments for this? Because I, I, I saw, I believe someone said it in our group chat, maybe. Uh, about there being someone on on the CW Flash that got fired for um, for tweeting something about about assault or violence. Yeah, so they, they were they were yeah they were some bad bad posts, and so uh, it was he should have been gone, and they handled that I think about as as well as they could. But like that's the thing with this is like consistency. There's a, vi there's a, vi a very fine line between thinking we're not saying this person is without redemption and, and that they're never going to be like that. They're not dealing with something very difficult, nothing like that, but there's a fine line between understanding and thinking this person should be representing major, major characters in the public uh, eye. And so it's a tough situation. It's going to be interesting to see how WB handles it, but we got, wait, we got fun stuff to talk about. We're here to bring joy to your life. We're not here to bring uh, stress and, and, and grief to your life. So let's talk about something fun. Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special. It's been, it's been confirmed by James Gunn that we're going to be meeting some new characters. And one of the most fun theorized one that we could be seeing in this show is Santa Claus, an Omega level mutant. Maybe, uh, potentially appearing in the MCU and that maybe he could be played by Mark Hamill. Mo, I want to start with you. What do you think about that rumor and what other characters might you want to see introduced in the holiday special? Uh, so I'm probably going to get hate for this, but I don't, I, well, I don't do Christmas uh, culturally, religiously. I'm not, it's not something that I do. So Christmas specials always kind of get me a bit. Mm. So I'm, um, um, maybe, but I think Mark Hamill's always a good addition to anything. Obviously, mm -hmm. uh, he's got yeah. Uh, him working with James Gunn, I think they sort of have a similarly wicked sense of humor. Um, so I feel like that could be a really good pairing. I don't know if they've done any projects together, but I feel like that could be a really good pairing anyway. Um, it would be weird for them to introduce mutants in a holiday special that people are going to think people aren't going to watch. Um, but it just depends on how on how how they do it. If it's just done as like a little jab, or if they even do it in Doctor Strange, or maybe even in the final two episodes of Moon Knight. I don't know. <laughs> um, they've got a lot of space between now and then uh, to actually introduce mutant into different projects. Big um, time, but yeah, it, would just, it could be. If, and if they brought Santa Claus what, in, what I don't necessarily sure think it would... Sorry, Mo, you were cutting out a little bit there, so I just tried to... Uh, I, I just figured I'd bring some oh. in. Um, if they bring Santa Claus in, I don't actually think it would necessarily have to be a mutant, but in, an interesting thing, too, is we know James Gunn's sense of humor and James how James Gunn is willing to... He's all about representation. He's all about bringing things to the screen, pushing boundaries... And we also know this is a holiday special. This isn't necessarily a Christmas special. It's a holiday special. So um, I feel like there could potentially be a lot of different holiday characters who could be brought in. And that could be an aspect. And Santa Claus might be a big one just because not, not just it's Santa, but Mark Hamill. That's the reason why it would be such a big one is if they would do that, that'd be super cool. But yeah. uh, it's going to be interesting to see what James does with this. I mean, speaking yeah. to that, it's. I think it's one of those things where, like, now that it's out there, 
if if that happens and it's not Mar- if we get a Santa Claus in this Christmas session and it's not Mark Hamill, like I don't I don't. It think- almost it if 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 there is a Santa, it almost has to be Mark Hamill or like yeah, like I- or something. Yeah, I can't think of anyone else who I'd like rather. Yeah, unless it's Kevin Feige. If it's Kevin Feige, I'll accept it not being Mark Hamill. But I, I like really can't picture it as anyone other than Mark Hamill now that that's been out there. Yeah, it's just like a Mephisto thing. Yeah. Like, yeah. like everyone's saying they want Mephisto, they want Mark Hamill Fisto. But yeah, they, they need it. But no, it's... it's it, we what know we're saying, gonna sorry? see Richard. We know we're gonna see Richard Ryder in the future at some point, and I think maybe the mm-hmm. holiday special wouldn't be the best place to introduce him. But I think Guardians would be, and so maybe that could be Guardians of the Galaxy three. I think also a fun character to introduce to the MCU in the holiday special, if he hasn't already been introduced in Multiverse of Madness, would be Deadpool. I think Deadpool would be somewhere, right. someone you could weave in there and make sense because he could do something stupid and say something about how hey, this doesn't make sense, or I've always hated holiday specials. The Star Wars one sucked, something like that. <laughs> and it would just fit perfectly. That is true. That is true. I think the Deadpool, film, the Deadpool 3, I've, yeah. I've cut you off three times already, Mo. I feel so bad, so I'm going to work to not <laughs> it's do okay. it. It just popped into my head, and I want to. I can't not say it. <laughs> I'll raise my I hand. I really want to say, hand. see, <laughs> Ryan Reynolds is Deadpool saying to Mark Hamill's Santa Claus that the Star Wars holiday specials sucked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no that will be it'll be interesting i think i would i i wouldn't mind if deadpool's first introduction was in was to the mcu was in on a disney plus show that or a disney plus special that would be quite quite a good one but i think we've also got the um halloween special coming up this year don't we yeah we're by night yeah so i'm more interested in that one because i like halloween yeah I love I love Halloween. I go out all the time, get um, get costumed up and all of that. Yeah, last yeah. year I tried to go costumed my... up and all of that. I see you censoring yourself as you were as you were uh, going through there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I did try and dress as Michael Myers uh, last year, but I wound up looking like a plumber um, <laughs> because, <laughs> because I didn't have the mask, <laughs> so I just had the blue overalls. <laughs> and, and I've still got the blue overalls like in like in my bedroom or something. And every time I look at them, I'm like, oh god, what a stupid costume. <laughs> oh, that is fantastic. Oh. So Mo, I want to know, bring bring our viewers more into the life of Mo. Give us yeah. what are some of your top MCU projects that you've loved? Give me like it doesn't have to be necessarily favorite, but like one mm. of your top movies, one of your top shows. And then also your um, most anticipated for 2020, 2022. Right. Okay. Top, top MCU project hands down is Moon Knight. I think I've said it every, every single time. Like I've got a chance to say it. it's my favorite. It used to be Doctor Strange, the, the, obviously the first one, but it used to be Doctor Strange. Now it's hundred percent Moon Knight. Um, and I'll, you, I think your audience will get a sense of why. Uh, in in a couple of minutes when we talk about it but I think it's also just like it's just, it's such a fantastically done show um favorite film hmm. that's a good one I don't I don't actually know probably Doctor Strange yeah probably Doctor Strange um and then most anticipated this year so obviously we spoke about this before but I'm a trainee lawyer Mm-hmm. So, I am most anticipated. My most anticipated is Miss Marvel. <laughs> no, oh. she Hulk. <laughs> yeah, no oh, disrespect to Miss Marvel. Got I can't you. Wait for got Marvel you, too. But uh, <laughs> yeah. she Hulk is also my most anticipated of 2022. Um, yeah. I uh, shout out to Tatiana Maslani from Saskatchewan, Canada, just like myself. <laughs> I can't wait for this one. This is going to be yeah. awesome. Speaking of Cameo City. Yeah. And it sounds like they're doing a lot of different things with it. Like uh, one of, I don't know if you saw this show, it was only on for about two years and then it got canceled, but it was a really good show called Trial and Error. Um, So that was on NBC. um, And I think it might have aired in Canada. It didn't air in the UK, but I watched it on a plane (laughs) um, because I had like a six or seven hour flight somewhere, like two, six or seven hour flights. And it was just all on, like, I just watched it all on the plane there. 
anyway, that was like a mockumentary like The Office and Parks and Rec. Um, but it was all about a, like a law firm trying to solve a case. Um, so I, and, and I think that that's something, something similar that they're doing in, um, in She-Hulk, a bit, a, bit, a bit fourth wall breaky. Um, it's emphasizing on the comedy um, aspect of it. So I'm hoping it's a little bit more episodic because I believe She-Hulk is getting a second season. Um, they're planning it as a multi-season show. Um, so I'm hoping that there's a little bit more like a case or like one case per episode type thing or um, or a little bit or, and like an overarching storyline. But it does look to be like legal comedies is, is a genre that I could like, I could watch forever. Um, there just aren't that many. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. I can't wait for this show as well. But yeah. enough talking about shows that we are yet to see. And let's talk about a show that premiered March 30th for the general public, something that we got to see a little bit earlier, Moon Knight now on Disney+. Plus. So if you haven't seen the first episode of Moon Knight, here is your spoiler warning. Press pause on the podcast, press pause on the YouTube video, like it while you are at it. And it is now your chance to go and watch Moon Knight. Check out our spoiler-free reviews on agentsoffandom.com if you have yet to do so. But now it's time. Let's talk to Moon Knight. Mo, tell me about yes. your general thoughts of the first episode. What did you think about it? General thoughts. How long have you got? Because <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I have a lot. I have a lot to say about. I have a lot to say about Moon Knight. But I just want to say that it is. I think it's the only Marvel project that does every single thing right. Um, so whether or not that's the acting, the storyline, the setup, the use of the television format, or the use of the format that it's in. So I know there was a criticism of Eternals that it that the pacing felt a bit off, um, that it should have been a ten episode Disney Plus series or something. Um, and likewise with one uh, with uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier, it was the pacing was a bit off. It should have been a um, it should have been a film, right? Whereas I think this used the medium that it was set in just absolutely perfectly. It nailed the direction, like just from a, from a set design perspective, from the, how the overall episode was composed, completely, completely nailed that. And the cinematography is just, is just completely like, unlike anything that Marvel has ever put out before. So I, I, I've got, yeah, I've got nothing but praise for the show. I think on the space that I held earlier, I tried to draw some negatives out of people and the only one that I could think of, which isn't even that bad, it was the CGI on the on the bus chase, on the truck scene, the car chase scene. Mm -hmm. That was a little bit wonky, but, and I didn't notice it when I watched it because I was watching it on debut. Um, so it was like, my internet connection was a bit bad anyway, or debut like takes a while to load things. So I, it was a bit blurry anyway. So I was like, whatever, I'm, I'm just not even gonna talk about CGI. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was the only only negative that I had. And that's not even that big because CGI and the rest of it's amazing. So Yeah, I agree with you there. Garrett, what did you think? Honestly, like unless the CGI is like ridiculously bad, I don't I'm like I, I tend to not care as much about that as Unless it's Henry Cavill's mustache not being there, yeah. If it's I like don't that, notice it. No, if it's like that level of bad, like I don't know. I'm I, I'm not really like focused hard enough on that kind of stuff unless I'm on like my fourth rewatch. So that doesn't yeah. usually necessarily like bother me. Um, I you not on it. your fourth rewatch. I dude, I've <laughs> I've seen it once. I've seen the four episodes one time. I I was so busy today, but I was able to watch like the first. I don't know, like six minutes of the first episode again. Um, <laughs> I can't wait to watch it again. But no, I've been so incredibly busy with this new job and um, figuring f figuring out our growth with the website and all that stuff that I I haven't been able to to dive Fair into enough. it as much as I want. But it doesn't it doesn't <laughs> matter because I didn't I didn't need the fourth rewatch to like fall in love with it. I fell in love with every single episode the first watch um yeah. and i'm i'm enthralled i i still need to know like where it's going no spoilers um but yeah the first episode is is i think an incredible debut i think in my opinion it is the strongest entrance into um 
of of all the Disney Plus shows. It's the strongest premiere episode. And yeah, I can't I cannot praise Oscar Isaac enough for for his acting. But yeah, same, uh, well, same boat as me, Garrett. That's yeah. like this was the biggest, this was the biggest, the most impressive series opener to me of any of the ones we've seen so far. It hooks you. It it it's shrouded in so much mystery, but it's not shrouded around mystery in the way that WandaVision or Loki are, where you're you're kind of constantly looking for MCU Easter eggs. Like, what's that? What's that? Mephisto, Mephisto, you know what I mean? With this. <laughs> You're trying to figure out what it's going on, but it's very contained. You're trying to figure out what's going on with Stephen Grant and what's going on with the plot. And the highlight yeah. for me was just like you were saying at the end there, Garrett, Oscar Isaac. He was amazing. I wrote this up on my review on the site that I think this is one of like the best acting, like MCU acting performances we are going to see. Like Oscar Isaac is going to be Tony Stark, Robert Downey Jr. It's going to be um Vincent D'Onofrio Kingpin Charlie Cox Daredevil who, like whoever your top tier uh actors for those roles are I think Oscar Isaac is going to fit this Mark Hamill because... Santa Claus <laughs> <laughs> this this is going to fit that because he embodies chaos in his performance so perfectly it's just such a he can be so calm and so meek but still embody the like Ethan Hawke's character, uh, Arthur Harrow says, there's chaos inside of you. And Oscar Isaac portrays that absolutely perfectly. Mo, what did you think of his portrayal? Yeah, I thought I thought it was really, really nuanced. Obviously, there's a little bit that I talk about in my review, um, but I think he handles the switches really well. Uh, were you at the press conference uh, for it? Because one of the things he said there was about how he basically would get his brother to act alongside him where if it wasn't uh, so if he was Stephen, his brother would be Mark whenever he's having the scenes of him talking to himself um, and I thought that that was a really interesting thing because the impression that I got when I watched the episodes was that Mark is sort of the protector of Stephen um, and tries to sort of hide Stephen from seeing different things um, and from seeing things that he shouldn't see so and and he said uh, like you can see a little bit of that in the in the bathroom scene at the end of episode one because what he says is like let me like let me help you you need to give me control so I can help you type thing yeah so it's 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 that level of and he and he genuinely makes you feel like there's two different people there um, and I I think the accent obviously helps a little bit um, it helps to distinguish between between Stephen and Mark but I more than that I think it definitely. It, it just is a testament to how, how well he acts as one of the scenes. I, you guys saw my notes for episodes, for all the episodes that I watched. And there's one of the scenes in episode, I think it's three, you know, where the camera just lingers on him. And, yeah. and it just that scene as well was like, it blew my mind. Like the last 10, that's what like, yeah, the last 10 minutes of episode three, just completely sky, sky high for the, for me. Well, and like, so when we talk about Oscar Isaac, we're going to talk about Stephen Grant. We're going to talk about this, the mental health aspect and how he plays it, um, mm. which we have that later on the rundown, but this kind of all ties together. And something that I really, really like about his portrayal that I'm going to try and talk about without being too spoilery, because a lot of it gets dealt with in the future is how this show, uh, Muhammad Diab's direction and Oscar Isaac handle the dissociative identity disorder of Mark Spector, Stephen Grant, and Moon Knight, because it's not, we're not viewing it through a lens of a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Like we're not viewing it from a clinical lens of these, this is how it is viewed by doctors. And these are all the symptoms. We're viewing it by somebody who's living it and who does not understand it who has, mm. especially the Stephen Grant persona, has absolutely no idea what's going on. Like he thinks he's suffering, yeah. suffering with narcolepsy. He thinks he's going on sleepwalks and stuff like that. He doesn't know what's happening. And yeah. I love how Oscar Isaac portrays that. And like you said, with the conversations with himself, I think we see in the first episode, Mark knows a bit more than Stephen. But this is also something, Gary, you've theorized a lot on as well, because it doesn't, it seems like Mark and Steven may not be the only ones there. 
Okay, we're gonna get to that right now. Yeah, we are. It, it's it's we're leading. I mean, the conversation is leading us there, so we might as well talk about it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I I and I think there are others of of my same mindset. I I think that there's at least one other personality that we haven't seen yet, and that's not a spoiler. That's just my thoughts. Um, yeah, and there are like I think red herrings for that in episode one here and we'll see what you I want to see hear what you think about this as well Mo but one of the most talked about things in in uh on on the internet after episode one is is our man Gus the fish and uh Gus the blender fish and (laughs) while I don't think the fish the goldfish is really all that significant what I do Mm. think is significant is Stephen's experience with it because somebody was at the fish store yesterday it, it, doing an exchange. And I don't think that was Mark. Why would Mark be at the fish store? He's got bigger things on his plate. Somebody else had to have asked his coworker out. It wasn't Steven. It wasn't Mar- uh, Mar- I don't think it'd be Mark because like I said, bigger things on his plate. And you'd think that the British accent, the, the British accent, exactly. Mm-hmm. The British accent. You think that she would notice him not having a British accent and then having a British accent. So I definitely think there are more indications that there could be another personality yet to be seen. That is not just the moon Knight portrayal, but somebody else. What do you think of that idea Mo? And also just Oscar Isaac's job uh, and, and, the director, uh, Mohammed Diab, who you have a, a nice relationship, uh, with already. How do you think that's Uh, all been handled so far? So I'll start it. Uh, I'll start it in reverse a little bit. So I think you start the story from it's the story is being told from Steven's perspective, right? He doesn't know he has the dissociative identity disorder. As you said, he thinks he's got narcolepsy. He thinks he's, um, he thinks he's going on sleepwalks which is fine well it's not fine but it's uh it's 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 manageable um to some degree like he's taken steps to mitigate but i think more interesting than that is the idea that the audience is placed in steven's situation we get all the information that we need to get from from him within his first what five minutes of appearance on screen um and I think that that's done really effectively to try and put us in Stephen's shoes and sympathize more with him um, as opposed to sympathizing with effectively a killer, a pay, uh, like a hitman for hire, um, because it's, it's a lot easier to do that. So I think it was important for Oscar Isaac to nail, um, I want to say lovableness, if that's a word, of uh, to nail like, that aspect of Stephen, and I think he did a really good job of doing that. Um, but yeah, yeah as I you agree. said about the, uh, as you see, yeah, and as you said about the fish, we don't know what's happened or who got the fish, who got the other fish. But I've, I have a, I have a thing on what the fish actually means, but it's not, it's, it's not related to a third person. Yeah, I mean, there you go. so check out, check out Mo's website streamer for uh, his, his exclusive take on <laughs> Gus the fish. <laughs> Everything is everything I do is an exclusive take because there's no way anyone else has my opinions. <laughs> <laughs> True. But, and so, uh, one of the opposite sides to Oscar Isaac's uh, Stephen Grant and Mark Spector is Ethan Hawke's Arthur Harrow. And so, this character he's playing is a bit different than his comic book counterpart. And it seems like this rendition is going to be somewhat of an amalgamation of Arthur Harrow, as well as the Sun King, just based on the way that he amalgamates followers and uh, that whole situation in the in the town square. How, what do you two, both of you think about Ethan Hawke's portrayal of Arthur Harrow so, Harrow so far? Um, I feel like, Garrett, we both have kind of different we viewed his character differently in terms of how we felt about him but I almost feel like it's one of those same situations we often have where we are just using different uh where we're just using different words to kind of articulate similar feelings so Mo I want to hit you first what do you think about uh Arthur Harrow so far 
Uh, yeah, I think it's it's definitely a portrayal we've seen before. It's not it's nothing new from a villain. Um, this kind of calm, stoic person. It's nothing new from nothing new that we've seen before of all there. Um, so I'm not I'm not mad at that at all. Um, and obviously, we're keeping it to episode one. Um, so well, yeah, we're keeping it to episode one. So this idea of of this character who doesn't really want to be a villain or who doesn't see himself as a villain um from episode one i'm not entirely convinced that he is i'm not I, i'm not convinced that he thinks he's doing the right thing um I, I, and and i think that's very like we get very limited screen time with him and he but he's obviously he obviously i imagine would get a bit more developed as the episodes progress um, and you start to see a little bit more about what he's after, um, or maybe he won't get developed at all and just become like a flat out Thanos in the first twenty minutes of Endgame, or the, or the last twenty minutes of, of Endgame, where he is just like, "Nah, I want to kill everyone." <laughs> so well, who who knows? You know, not us. Not not me, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so we yeah. could we could see some of that, um, but I think it's it's a good performance. It's it's a very competent performance. Um, but I didn't talk about it much in my review because I'm like he's been acting for 50 years now if he didn't do his job correctly that would be a bit of a shame <laughs> it's nothing it's not an outstanding performance I'm not feeling like oh yeah I, def- I definitely want to join his cult or anything um, from the first episode I'm not feeling that maybe from future episodes I will but I'm yeah. hoping yeah sorry sorry just one last thing I was just going to say that I'm, I'm hoping that they that they don't do this twist villain in episode whatever thing or like hint at a secret villain i want it i want this show to just give its characters and its storylines that it's introduced the proper conclusion that they need um and well sorry one other last thing but i think that if any show that has been released so far has the chance to do that it's going to be moon knight because when whereas one division and um hawkeye had to set up they had to kind of be referential to everything that happened before it and also set up a bunch of future projects like Monica Rambo in the Marvels and you've got Wonder and Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. Um, this show doesn't have those ties to the MCU. It's not trying to um, pay respect to things that have gone before it and it's not trying to, at the very least, set up everything as, as well, uh, set up everything to come after it. What it's trying to do is tell this very singular story um, and you can tell that that's what they're trying to do because I think there's only maybe two references to the MCU at large within the episodes that we saw, obviously. Um, so yeah, I think it does a re- I think if any show and Loki did have that to some degree as well. Um, but yeah, yeah, Loki did have that to some degree because it was it wasn't the Loki that we'd been following for however many years or whatever. So he didn't have to pay reference to everything that came before him and everything that's going to come after him because it's not trying to set up anything else. It's trying to just have Loki on a fun little adventure and that's why I think the Loki series landed really well with a lot of people and See, that's I think something Loki I spoke set up to a lot. yeah I think Loki it set up a ton and I think that's what I spoke to a bit of this in my uh, review on the website of how exactly like you said Mo this show seems very contained and the MCU references and easter eggs aren't aren't heavy and I think there was a moment I think maybe it was episode three where I felt like I was the Leonardo DiCaprio meme where he's sitting back in his yeah. chair and he's like, oh, yeah. oh, 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 because it's like, oh, they said something. And I forgot that exactly. that was what this was connected to. But bringing yeah. back to what you said about the twist villain and stuff like that, I, 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 I too hope they don't bring somebody else in and he stays the main antagonist. And one of the other things I like about this show, and I think it's, really a theme of the newest phase of the MCU that they're doing is the big antagonist is inner conflict and morality. And we see that in Spider-Man No Way Home. We see that in Eternals and we see that in Shang-Chi. And I think that's continuing this way. And so we see the St- Stephen Grant and Mark Spector are, are obviously going to be very different people. Arthur Harrow and Amit and Khonshu are going to be very, di- have very different perspectives. And so I think that's going to be a big, almost like antagonist, if you will, as well, is what side are you on? 
almost and the have the, the 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 illusion of choice and the illusion of how what what side should i align myself with here what do you think gareth i think uh i i well first of all i really enjoyed his performance um mm-hmm. we we might you know we might have seen it before but i i felt it was it was really compelling um to that point there's not a lot that i can say about it after the I, I have a lot more to say about it after the first episode there's not too much that i can go off on the first episode so i will agree with you that like maybe at the first episode i, I don't think i would have joined the cult but there's exactly. definitely more development going on and i was like i was intrigued at first but it wasn't until i learned more about the character uh in the future that I, that I got invested, but I did get invested a lot. And so I'm excited for that to come. Mm. And, and I, and I, and I do think that there's merit to what you're saying, TJ, about, about choosing sides. And I think that there's a blurred line in the show of, of what's right. And I think that we're tossed a lot of knowledge and we're, we're forced to make our own opinions uh, based on who we see and 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 the allegiances that we see and I uh, where we're at in the story I'm like I just need more and I have so much to like it's it's really ha- it's very hard to just talk about the first episode right now because my thoughts are yeah. so much bigger than that and that so the sense. word I the word I used to describe him was sinister and the reason I feel that way is he's not blatant he's not out here I'm going to take over the world and kill everyone. He's he's very he's very subtle with how he does things. Not in the sense that he'll just kill you if the scales don't balance on the spot. Not subtle in that way, but subtle in the sense that it's the type of villain like a Killmonger or like a Thanos where they don't think they're evil. They're trying to convince you that their method is right. And he gives you the elevator pitch in this episode, right? Um, if with Amin in charge, like we could have stopped Hitler and we could have stopped all of these genocides in the past before they happen. So you get the, you get the elevator pitch, but he's sinister as well, because how does the episode open the show? The show opens not with Oscar Isaac's Moon Knight, but with Ethan Hawke's Arthur Harrow dropping some glass into his shoes just Mm. for some self-harm for the gods type of thing, right? To get the, the episode going a sacrifice a pain sacrifice to the gods and so you know there is definitely some imbalance and some chaos going on within this man as well and it's not just uh stephen grant and uh mark specter who have the chaos within them no matter how together this man thinks he has it there's some chaos going on inside of him too he's like a zealot he's like a religious zealot yeah yeah i mean it's it seems a bit weird for um this I, w- I would presume this white guy from the u.s to have such an affinity to the egyptian gods and want to literally walk on glass for them um but i mean i can't judge <laughs> there's no, probably a reason for that who knows probably a, we there might is get probably to that. A re- yeah but that's uh, a good point yeah good I, point. I, I but i i think it is very what, what do you think the reason that he was chosen as a villain was kind of if you eliminate if you yeah if you eliminate every everything else for it why was he chosen as a villain as opposed to someone like dracula or sun king i think again it's hard to talk about this in only the context of the first episode um, i do think right. we see even in the first episode like the mcu likes to combine characters and i do think arthur harrow sun king is going to be the same thing do you think so i do i i don't (laughs) because that's again that's what i what i don't what i don't want to see is like this we knew that like i i i I hope not i would hope not that there's no um there's no big reveal that this character is actually someone else but and then that's what i'm saying i don't think it's going to be a reveal that he's someone else i'm saying like i think it's going to be 
they're going to take aspects from this character Sun King from the comics and mm. weave that into Arthur Harrow's character and his right character. okay yeah oh, okay right okay not That's so fun. much like That's I'm fun. not actually Arthur Harrow I'm this guy but like <laughs> the yeah, yeah like, like the Scooby like the Scooby Doo <laughs> exactly. have, have characterizations of both but that really brings us into our next topic of Khonshu and the Egyptian gods and so before we there is so much Egyptian history and Egyptian culture in the first episode and that is going to be a through line through the entire series and so mm. there are some aspects that like if you're not a historian I understand how maybe parts of this series won't be for you because it's like if you're sitting there wanting I want more action and I'm struggling to follow this personally for me I thought it was awesome I love it it was like the MCU's version of it's like the MCU's version of National Treasure and uh, Indiana Jones for me, and I think that's fantastic, but darker. Um, first off, before we talk about the rest of the Egyptian gods and the connections we see there, what did we think of Khonshu? Mo, I want to start with you. I thought Khonshu was amazing. I thought Khonshu's humor was just like. I don't know if it was the line delivery or whether it reminded me of the banter between um, Tom Hard, uh, Eddie Brock and Venom. Um, the voice did too! Was... Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, so I, but I wrote in my in my episode one notes that, oh, Venom, because, you know, when he was controlling him with the scarab in his hand. Um, yeah. And then when I, when, when I showed the notes to one of the people on my site, they were like, what Venom's in this? And I was like, no, no, God, you idiot. I can't explain why, but <laughs> no. Um, but I, I, I thought the, I think that Konshu is going to be, is definitely like, yeah, he, he's definitely going to be a lot of people's favorite, um, favorite character. And I hope he gets his own character poster because I want to make that my background very expeditiously. Yeah, he um, looks incredible, doesn't he? Yeah, I thought yeah. I think that's where the CGI budget went, um, just on making on making yeah. Honshu look as realistic as possible. Um, and there yeah, are I more I awesome, looked. cool looks of Konju to come. Yeah, are there? Oh, I don't know. Are there? Are there? Are there? <laughs> I'm trying to. I'm we'll trying to think. Out. I'm genuinely. I'm genuinely asking because I can't remember. Anything. No, there are. Yes, there are. Okay. There are 100 uh, percent more. Uh, yeah, we see some great shots of, of Kanchu. Oh, shots. Okay. Th I thought you meant like outfits. And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, like, like, I'm sure he wears awesome the same thing all the time. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You're like, yeah, Just... no, he, it does, he doesn't change. <laughs> I love... Yeah, I know. I was... <laughs> <laughs> he has a bunch of different wardrobes. That would be hilarious. Yeah. Um, no, I love his, his dynamic with, um, with Mark and Steven and how he, how he talks to Mark and he's like, yo, get a handle on this one dude the, the 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 idiot like come on this is yeah. he's ruining our stuff and um i think it's a really cool way to kind of let us in on the relationship between mark and conchu and uh just just who who conchu is and how he operates uh himself and how that might turn some people away or how some people are able to deal with um part aspects of his personality so i think there's a lot of really cool stuff coming up with Conchu, and uh they knocked it out of the yeah. park yeah i think they did a really good job of making sure that and i think Conchu sets a lot of the tone um for the humor of the series because it's an mcu project you know it's gonna have some jokes in it but these jokes are unlike anything that marvel has ever done before um with uh, as far as like just the subject matter, how dark they can get, and how they're not actually jokes. They're more like, no, you need to, like, they're more realistic. They feel more like, they, they, they definitely just feel, even though it's an Egyptian god whispering into his ear, um, they feel like something a real person would say to you as opposed to just thinking on the spot, um, like a quippy one-liner, like, he, got, he beat me by five seconds or whatever. Um, yeah. So yeah, I quite, I, I, so I appreciated the, that, that level of that, that that excitement that Konshu brought to it because it made it feel it made him feel different it made the show feel different it made him feel like his little partner Pokemon walking alongside him yeah it did that's a good that's a good analogy and I agree with you completely I got big Venom vibes from that kind of partnership and 
we're going to see more exploration of the Egyptian gods. We had so much talk of it early with Stephen Grant, the gift shop employee who has a love of Egyptian mythology and a love of the, uh, the, the Egyptian gods and the history and learning about it. And a theory that I had, and so this is, again, this is nothing related to what we've seen in episodes one through four. Um, but it's more of a Thor love and thunder theory as to why there's still no damn trailer for this movie yet. And that's, I think Moon Knight, maybe in the post credit scene, maybe in the finale, could be the debut of Gore the God Butcher. And I think the post credit scene would make the most sense. But we have, we have already all of this talk about Egyptian gods. I think it would be pretty cool for in a post credit scene for Gore to take somebody that we've met along the way, take him out and give us a taste of, of his power going into Thor Love and Thunder. Mo, what do you think? Uh, Garrett and I have discussed this lots. I've been, I've been talking about this one since before Moon Knight, even before we saw uh, anything. And even for the past, like probably month and a half. Um, what do you think of that theory? I can't say anything on that. Sorry. <laughs> um, there you go. His lips Kevin are sealed. Feige's, Kevin Feige is sitting outside my door right now. I can see the red dot. There you go. So we don't know what Mo knows, what Mo doesn't know, but it's always with having seen four episodes, it's always better to keep our lips tight with some of these things, but don't worry there. That isn't going to be anything uh, uh, you see. I'm not spoiling anything. So don't worry about that. Through Yeah. And I'm pretty sure we've, we've said it on the pod before and it's, and it's, and it's dated and it's, pre mm. before we ever watched moon night and we could we could ha- we could throw oh, yeah. the receipt, we got we could a chuck the receipts out if to we go back needed, on. yeah if we <laughs> needed to so i think we're all good there this definitely a, this theory does not have anything to do with anything we've seen just something mm. that we've been talking about personally amongst ourselves for yeah i a what i will bit say now. though what i will say though is that i've i've got a theory that thor love and thunder's trailer is going to release on a thursday just because it's thor's day so yep. it could be tomorrow, could be tomorrow, it could be could be next week, it could be the week after, or you get what I'm saying. It could be, but having it... Thursday having, happens um, to be the day after Wednesday when Moon Knight comes Yeah, out. exactly, exactly, exactly that. So I very much think it could be a, a Thursday. And it's getting to a very, very short window of time before the re- releases anyway. So why haven't they just, you know, sped it up a bit? But, and it's like i totally uh, get like uh all the people saying to like it's they've never this has been the shortest release uh, ever the only one left is the hulk like why aren't they doing it yet this is crazy they don't need to mm. they don't need yeah. to it's thor people are gonna watch mm, yeah maybe but i know a lot of people were put off by ragnarok people liked it people really did like it but a lot of a lot of people like my dad for some reason he loved the first two um, and when I talk about my dad, I'm more repre- I'm more talking as about him as a representative of the general audience. Like he loved the first two Thors, and he thought Ragnarok was just silly. He thought it, like they turned the character into a bit of a joke. Whereas people who are like, I want to say more invested in this, will like understand that okay, Thor's meant to be a bit funny and a bit goofy, and it's a bit, mm-hmm. it's all a bit stupid because he's an alien who's also a god. But like he's not actually a god; he's just uh, he's just an alien. Like, and it, it the whole premise is like super goofy, and he's and Thor's meant to not not be taken that seriously anyway. Yeah. Um, so I so I feel like general audiences are going to be like, oh, okay, cool, and they'll think that the Disney Plus shows because we just had Loki last year. The Disney Plus shows are going to be like, okay, why why are we seeing Thor? We just had Loki. Because yeah. they have done, they haven't done much marketing for this anyway, and Tiger's got way too many projects coming out. So, um, like people are just anything he he's he's slightly attached to, they put at the very front of any trailer. Um, mm. So they'll be like, oh, from visionary director Taika Waititi, um, or whatever it is, um, no matter how involved or how like uninvolved he is in it, um, that he's sort of lost the novelty now. So it's not like people are waiting on his next project because if they can Google Taika Waititi next film or next show or whatever it is, they'll just see whatever's coming out next on HBO. 
So I feel like they've I feel like they really messed up with the marketing a little bit. It's not like with Spider Man where everyone was kind of hoping, oh, they'd do something and and they do it uh, and they wound up doing it or they'd reveal something in the trailer. Um, with this, it's like Thor isn't a character that a lot of people care that much about anyway. I would say people care more about Loki. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think I don't think that's the case, but I guess we'll see. We'll see. I'm to, to I'm be have to determined. Grab my mule, my Mjolnir over there in the corner <laughs> of my room. <laughs> to to be yeah. determined. I don't think the the it, the trailer release is is going to end up affecting the uh, the box office at all, but. There's one more thing on the Moon Knight episode I want to touch on because we could talk about this stuff all day, but we are starting to run out of time. And that is something our friend uh, Task on Twitter, at Up to Task, he found uh, when looking at the credits, and that was the name Crawley. And Crawley in the Moon Knight comics is an informant of, uh, of Moon Knights. And the man playing him was the statue dude, like the statue guy. Yeah. That is Crawley. And so yeah. they're confirming that that is a character from the comics who is one of Mark Spector's Moon Knight's informants. And so very interesting that that's a char- that that could be maybe a character that we get to see more of in the future. Mo, uh, thank you yeah. so much for joining us today. This has been an absolute oh. blast and I can't wait to talk some more Moon Knight with you in the future. Yeah, no, thank you for having me on. I want to I want to be on maybe maybe on the episode four one because it's just episode four i mean episode three is my favorite actually so if you want to save someone else for episode four do that but episode three is peak cinema yeah i enjoyed thank you very much a lot yeah and so what was your what was your what was your ranking actually i would probably go worst to best two and by the way i loved them all so worst is like maybe not the best term here um but two four one three right i honestly don't okay. know because uh, it's I so just, hard i love them all so <laughs> it's, much it's hard it's really hard yeah and they to yeah, be honest my... they jumble together for me they really jumble <laughs> together for me. yeah let me watch it again and uh yeah. let me watch when we get back to week four uh ask me that again and and i'll have a more definitive answer for you yeah, so mine, definitely easily uh what were you saying easily four yeah and i think it's three four one two yeah Okay. Yeah, three, four, one, two. I think both very solid ratings. And so we will definitely try and get Mo back on in the future <laughs> to talk some Moon Knight when we get to unveil a little bit more of the theories that we have already seen so far. We're also going to have our man Ron from POC Culture. He's going to be joining us for a Moon Knight episode, as well as our friend from the direct, Richard Nebbins, is going to be hopping back on for an episode as well. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you like the video. Help us combat the YouTube algorithm overlords. Help trying to push us down. Like I said, we were we got these screeners to do the Moon Knight content. We have Ms. Marvel uh, stuff coming up in the future to be able to keep bringing you this awesome stuff. We need you to be you to like these videos, subscribe on Apple Podcast, Spotify, check out the website, and all of that awesome stuff. Thank you so much for joining us today. For myself, thank you for our awesome guest Mo. That'll do it. Peace. Peace.